Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Steve Hester. I'm one of the uh, co-hosts of Pottywood. And uh, joining me, as always, is uh, it's some English guy. I don't know. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing well. But you, you dress up pretty smartly to talk to your barber. I know. I know. It's looking good, though, isn't it? Uh, I've got to admit, you put the effort in from the last time I saw you in person the other day where you look like John Turturro in Brain Donors. Uh, yeah. Before we do start, though, I do want uh, do want to give a big thanks to you. I'm I'm currently wearing the uh, the Warner Brothers uh, 100th anniversary um, jacket, um, which actually I'm going to take off because I don't know if you can hear this. Yeah, that's that's going to get quite annoying throughout the next uh, next few minutes. So just in the the wonders of editing, Superman I'm about change. to take it off. Ah, you see. Yes, lovely. The hoodie is back. And uh, in case you're wondering, got the matching t-shirts on as well. Thanks. No, not that we are sponsored by Warner Brothers, so we would happily take no, that we're not. money as well as yes. everyone else in this business. <laughs> but yes, uh, if, as you people may remember, I was heading off uh, to Los Angeles. Um, I've been back now a couple of weeks. I don't feel like it. My jet lag is severely all over the place still two weeks later. But we did get some uh, wonderful teas, courtesy of uh, Mr. Daly. Yes, yes. And the Judas we'll admit... Bill Daly and his Jonah Hex uh, robbery. I know. I was, we'll save that one for after dark. But yes, um, thank you very much for these, Bill. And uh, I think even though we, we are not sponsored by Warner Brothers, but Warner Brothers have been incredibly kind to us, and we can say that Right around now, I believe Richard Mirisch's Godzilla X Kong: The New Empire is about to be released. Big monsters and uh, you know all these ice creatures. Um, if, what is the opposite of ice? Fire. And speaking of fire, and it looks like uh, we're starting off yes. with, uh, I guess it's Suzanne Bayer's 2007 alert. <laughs> It's been a while. It's been a while. Things yeah, were lost in the fire. Starring uh, David Duchovny. David Duchovny, why won't you love me? Why won't you love me? Why won't you love me? David Duchovny, why won't you love me? Why won't you love me? Why won't you love me? That has been going around in my head. That is such a near worm from back in the days of the X-Files. And now you guys get to have it as well. It's my gift to you. That will live rent free inside your brain for ages. So kind um, of you, Steve. Yes, Halle, uh, David Duchovny, Halle Berry, and uh, Benicio del Toro. It's about the the aftermath of David Duchovny's death and his wife, played by the the lovely Halle Berry, um, decides to take in his best friend Jerry, played by Benicio del Toro, and uh, and get into live with them and do some odd jobs around the place um and the whole movie is about the the way that we are addicted to things whether it is uh in benicio del toro's case as a heroin addict or as in her case to the memory of her now deceased husband um and because he is a heroin addict and i didn't realize this at the time i actually made a note in my little journal saying that he always looks like he's about to suddenly force someone to od True. <laughs> he, he just does that kind of look about it, and uh, it's it's a fairly, I would say, a fairly slow burning movie. It's a very much a character study uh, about the, the the relationships that happen in very very small familial and friend groups, um, and I'm not entirely sure if it works. There's there's Ooh. certain parts where it does work. Um, I think the relationship between Halle Berry and David Duchovny was actually works quite well. Um, I wasn't a fan of all the incredible close-ups that were in this. And there were a huge number of close-ups of eyes and, and extreme tight close-ups of faces. And they all had that kind of wobbly, shaky camera, which was all the rage back in the 2000s, which, to be perfectly honest, unless it's in a documentary-style film or it's in... A great big huge blockbuster it i don't really think it worked i think no. the the kind of born trilogy was what really 
brought the whole handheld shaky cam thing uh, to the forefront. Everyone was using it after the Born Identity was used it. Yeah, but there it had a purpose. It was trying to yeah. promote this sense of urgency for, and for frenetic, frenetic action and stuff like that. Yes, of action. But do you really need that in a in a character study where there's just two people talking? I was less convinced about the relationship between Halle Berry and Benicio del Toro, mainly because I thought that she was she was an unnecessary bitch to him. You know, it should have been you, Jim. throughout i'd say about the first two thirds of the film and i get that she had the reservations between the relationship between her husband and his friend but she basically invites this guy into a house and then says yeah i wish you'd have died instead i wish you were dead and it's like i know that you're obviously hurting from from losing your husband but this is just like inviting someone up to your house to punch them in the face. Why are you doing this in such a horrible way? And then there is a turnaround towards the end of it, but the, the character just kind of goes out of a way to be so vicious towards him that it feels almost like a betrayal of what's been set up, that she suddenly does this 180 and wants to try and help him. I'm going to come in from the other angle here because I really, really love this movie. I did love this movie. Uh, I'm watching it again. I enjoyed it more on this kind of second viewing. So this was directed by Susan Bear. Susan Bear did a fantastic movie called In a Better World, which you should check out. Also, she did a, a brilliant, brilliant movie with Mads Mikkelsen called After the Wedding, uh, which is a, a beautiful character study. And she does do great character studies. She, she does really, really, really solid movies. Um, so I am a fan of Susan Bear's work. Uh, now, when we round out the actors for this movie, okay, so Halle Berry, uh, I think she's great in this movie. Uh, mm -hmm. She's on that Monsters Ball level of great for this movie, uh, which a Monsters Ball I still think is probably her crowning achievement as well. She won an Oscar for it, so yeah. well, exactly. I've got to be honest. In terms of um. The, the talent that's actually in this movie, I've got no problem with it. It's, I think for me, the, the issues for me lie more on a script level than anything else. Because I you can only really work with what is there on the page. And I just think the, the script itself wasn't as strong in parts as it was in others. No, well, kind of. I mean, the way, the way I look at it is a lot of people probably look at it and look at the subject matter and, and maybe get get kind of put off because they think it's a depressing movie and to be honest i don't view this as a depressing movie no there is and a I, undercurrent I, of hopefulness I, yeah I, I think it's a story about coping and surviving in the face of tragedy and i think these are the types of movies that actors of this caliber should be presented with mm. because they are the the best use of their talents and I know he mentioned it's a, it's a very kind of slow pace, but I think the slow pace of the movie is what truly makes you see that character depth. You know, oh yeah, I'm not I'm not saying slow paced as as a negative, not by any means, because not every movie has to be moving along a, a an absolute rocket. I'm just saying that there doesn't seem to be kind of like the ramp up that it needs. There's obviously the, he he has a spoilers relapse. Uh, in the last act of the movie, and then has to come back round again after being clean for so long. But that kind of felt like the movie was saying we need to have something happen now. It, yeah. It, it, it felt it felt quite contrived more than anything else. And I think that's kind of what's bugging me. It's like why I said that the problem's more at the script stage than anything else. Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand that argument. Um, I think the, the main thing that really carries that through, I mean, it is a movie where you're basically dealing with the after effects of something that's happened mm. and that kind of crater that's left in like these people's lives are just trying to find a way they're they're essentially like ghosts in their own lives because this person's been ripped out of it del taro incredible uh, i i am a big fan of del taro it's somehow he effortlessly manages to be cool in any movie that he's in even at this stage th there's that quiet coolness about him and you mentioned david duchovny which is like um someone trying 
really good to do a uh, Jeff Goldblum impression <laughs> throughout his entire career. Yeah, he's he's never really been he's never really been an ex exciting performer. He is very subdued in his performance a lot of the time, all the way back from the X Files and when he was doing Twin Peaks and um, even when he was doing stuff like evolution he was still very very low key with it yeah. all. i think that's, that's just him that's just his style they're aliens we're, we've managed to go through the whole thing on things we lost so far without mentioning the fact that alison loman is also in this movie no alison loman she was also in uh, you probably won't have seen white oleander which isn't a good film uh tim burton's big fish no. um no uh ridley scott's matchstick man no. No. Okay. She's in this movie as well, and she does great. I, I think the standout performances, like in this film, I, I would watch it if you're a Halle Berry fan and really want to see her really acting. Yeah, that moment where she has that breakdown towards oh, the end. That it's was... brilliant. Yeah, absolutely brilliant moment. And fantastic uh, moment. I, I think that the young kid Micah Berry as well is. <laughs> Fantastic. The oldest six-year-old on the planet. The oldest six-year-old on the planet. But yeah, uh, does a fantastic job as well. I, I think the sad thing about this movie, it is a movie that was really lost in the shuffle. And this feels like a film that should have been, you know, among those slate for major award consideration. And I think it's really sad that it didn't. Uh, I think it is a film that should be rediscovered. That leads us to our second choice of what's in the box. And we're going to go a bit animated this week for you superhero fans, because what was pulled out was part of the DC animated universe. And that would be Justice League versus the Fatal Five. Now, this mm -hmm. was uh, a kind of long sought conclusion to the uh, Justice League animated series. Very popular five season run of Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. So this was a return to not just those characters and the voice characters. Rest in peace, Kevin Conroy. We'll get to yeah. you in a moment. But it was also a return to the Bruce Tim animation that we all kind of grew up with, with Batman, mm -hmm. the animated series, and of course, Justice League as well. Justice League versus the Furious Five. Um... Fatal Five. Okay. Justice League versus the Famous Five. If you've seen the other stories, you will be all caught up in, in what's going on here. And there are some characters which, as far as I could, because I did a little research myself, there are characters that are being introduced uh, for the very beginning, like Starboy and the new Green Lantern and, uh, and and so on. And it's funny that you mentioned that this was, this was at the end of a five series arc, plus all the other spin-off Justice League movies that have come along and it felt like that. It felt like you're walking into somewhere and around about series five and desperately trying to keep up with what's going on, having no knowledge of any of the background of any of the other characters versus general stuff. But anyway, Starboy comes into the past and he's uh brought there after chasing three members of the Fatal Five, who are a team of ne'er-do-well superheroes that are trying to get their other two members released from a futuristic prison. And to do this, they need to get hold of the current Green Lantern. So it's a story about facing up to your responsibility, like a lot of superhero movies are. And it, it does it very well. The animation is really lovely. It's so nice to hear the dulcet tones of Kevin Conroy again. Batman, is it? I think I will disintegrate you slowly. Bring it, Skeletor. Uh, Kevin Michael Richardson's voice as uh, Mr. Terrific is great. Um, he also played Kilowog. Most of like about the first half hour was just trying to find my footing with it. In amongst well, all the, the noise. Well, this actually links to the series. It doesn't link to uh, the greater Marvel anime DC stuff that has come out since. Uh, and if you've followed all of that all of those stories are kind of separate in the way that i think the superhero franchises should be these days mm. to be honest because it was so good back then before you had to watch tv series as well as movies and everything just to know who a character is yeah um, like the marvel cinematic universe trying to keep up with that is a full-time job yeah yeah it's i mean deadpool is the saving grace the, this year i think god Deadpool needs to reset that entire thing, you know, 
kill yeah. that universe off and reset it all. That's the only way they can do it. Well, he did um, that though. Deadpool yeah. kills the uh, the Marvel universe. Yeah, you know, that, and I'm kind of praying that's what's happened because everything's kind of been put back. But getting back to DC, anyway, this was kind of done separately. Uh, I know originally this was intended to be animated in the same way as uh, Crisis on Two Earths and Justice League Doom, which were the other movies that kind of came out at that time. Very updated, very stylized animation style. And I think they decided, no, we're going to go back to exactly how it was with the Justice League cartoon. It's for the fans of that, really. So they go back to that great Bruce Tim animation style that we grew up with, uh, with Batman the Animated Series. Mm-hmm. Even though we were teenagers, we we were still like, no, this is the coolest show. It was awesome ever, um, you know. And a big part of that was bringing back George Newbern as Superman and Kevin Conroy as Batman. And this actually is the last time that Kevin Conroy voiced with that original animated cast. And it was a point in time when this was released in 2019, I believe, if I'm right. Uh, where DC kind of started to make movies based around their old animation style. Uh, They also did uh, a standalone movie, uh, Batman and Harley Quinn. Oh, holy. It's not so bad. Smells like discipline. Speaking of which, Harley Quinn does have a little cameo in this, and you can tell they just had like a second worth of laughter track, and they just kept on looping it all the way along. So it's like, (laughs) ha ha ha, ha ha ha. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, oh, you've not got anyone in this one is directed not by our man jay oliver uh who had uh left one animation by this time this was directed by sam liu mm-hmm. uh who, who's kind of took that mantle now at uh, dc animated universe uh so he directed the controversial batman the killing joke uh which made a lot of press for the wrong reasons of like, yeah, has, has Batman been grooming Batgirl this entire time? Yeah, really that's, that's it's wrong. It, <laughs> Everyone was it, like, ooh. Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, ignore the first 10, 15 minutes, just watch the rest of it. Yes. Oh, don't watch that. But but also Sam also directed the tremendous Gotham by Gaslight, which is basically Batman chasing down Jack the Ripper, which is an amazing story set in old Victorian London. It's a brilliant animated film. Watching this again this week, uh, I was actually taken aback by it because I had seen it before, but I don't think I properly watched it. So when I was watching it this week, this one does deal with two major issues. One is schizophrenia and one is depression and really tastefully done as well. My biggest gripe with this movie that I saw this week. The Naked Starboy? <laughs> no. No, so that, that, that actually works. I'll throw that in. Superhero movies in general, apart from the establishing movie, it's all about the villains. Yeah. Right? The main problem with this, the the main villains, which is Mano, Tharok, and Persuader, they were very one-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, one's one's angry, one one's like a bad version of Cyborg, and the other one has an axe. Yeah. Uh, I would say the rule of thumb with really good superhero movies is make your villains more interesting than the heroes. So that's why it worked for Thanos. That's why it worked for, for, for the Joker. Um, if they're just kind of there to be the disposable bad guy of the week, you know, it's like going back to the old 60s Batman. There was so much potential for a bit of backstory. You could have added an extra 10 minutes on this movie and just had a Yeah, because it was only like about an hour and 17. Yeah. You know, you could have gone the full 90 minutes on this. I would happily have watched it. It, There's there's a point right at the end of the movie where all the bad guys are there and the plan's laid bare and they're about to destroy the sun and all of the Justice League are down. They've had their ass handed to them by these five guys. And then all of a sudden, the new Green Lantern comes out of nowhere and wipes the floor with all of them, like that, without breaking a sweat. Now, we're talking about experienced members of the Green Lantern Corps haven't been able to do that. All of a team of future superheroes weren't able to do that. And then all of a sudden, one girl who hasn't really been trained is just, yeah, I'm going to wipe. Yeah, that was annoying to me. 
Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about Captain Marvel for a minute. I do not need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work for him about A Wrinkle in Time. I think I was mentioning earlier on, um, this was supposed to be animated in the style of Christ of the Two Earths and Justice League Doom. Uh, interesting note here, the cast had already recorded their dialogue way before with the intent of it being in that style. So I'd love to know if they were kind of expecting that or not, or if there was any intent on doing that when they were voice recording it. I don't know. I don't know. It might be worth asking. Uh, Kevin Michael Richardson, give us a call. Yes. Love, <laughs> love to discuss some of your other projects. Yes, indeed. Um, so anyway, Justice League versus the Fatal Five. But the Fatal Five. Five um yeah i've got to be honest i wasn't too thrilled by it it felt like you needed other knowledge that obviously yeah. i didn't have because i've not seen those cartoons so as a standalone it's confusing uh, uh, yeah as a standalone because you, you you are asking why they, who are these people why are they there why are they part of the justice league how come i've never heard of them and some of it is explained some of it isn't and yeah like you say i thought that the villains were kind of forgettable um one note, way too easily defeated. It didn't really float my boat. It was nice seeing that Bruce Tim animation that, like you say, we grew up yeah. on. I still think the Batman the Animated Series is one of the greatest cartoons I've ever made. Um, so it doesn't have the emotional no. power of Mask of the Phantasm, which is probably no. one of the greatest. Fantastic movie, Mask now. of the Phantasm. Yeah, yeah. It ticks um, all boxes, that movie. Yeah. And it's got Mark Hamill's Joker. There are 20 miles of tunnels under this place, and they're all filled with high explosives. <laughs> yeah, if you're a DC fan, you'll probably get more out of it. Um, I, I like I like the characters. I don't really read the comics, so I didn't get much out of it. So there you go. Okay, so there we know. Uh, if you've not been following Justice League and all that, you're going to find it a bit difficult. But uh, if you have been, it's a nice, lovely throwback to that show. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's what's in the box for this week. Oh, I guess it's time to jump in some anniversaries, Steve. We watch them again all of the time, or we get them on Prime for free. But we only know how old they are when we learn their anniversary. Oh, boy, have I got a treat for us this week on anniversaries. Oh, I mean, it's unfortunate that we've missed a few because we had a few weeks off and there was some dynamite films to talk about. But this week in particular couldn't be missed. So as we always do for those people who are new and joining girls anniversaries, Hi, we guys. the films that were released in decades past on this very week. Mm -hmm. So traditionally we go back 40 years as our first one. And what a fantastic place to start. Because Steve, can you believe, I've prepared to feel really, really old. I know this is coming out in 1984 regardless, so yeah, hit me with it. It's it's the year where you feel really old. Yep. 40 years ago this week. Ooh, that one's right in the feels, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Right in the oh feels. Oh my good. God, yeah. Well, that does make sense because they were pumping one out every year throughout the 1980s. So they've got to start somewhere. When I was about 12, which would be in the early 90s, I watched these with an almost religious fervor. Yeah. Um, and, and I've got to be honest, I honestly think that the first one is probably one of my least favorite out of all of them there's a number of characters which didn't make it back in future installments as, and it's funny seeing how certain characters progressed as they went on sorry aged as they went on not really progressed <laughs> they're not they're not known for character studies in these movies at all where did you get this gun my mom gave it to me uh, the sad thing is is we, we started to lose members of the cast of police academy more recently um over the years, a lot of those original cast have passed on. Uh, Hooks, only a couple of years ago, but obviously we've yeah. lost Hightower, we've lost Tackleberry. Um, Tackleberry died sometime in, in the late 90s, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. Um, 
also uh, Commandant Lassard. So, and, George Gaines, oh, yeah. Look, then, of GW Bailey is still with us and yes. looks exactly the same as he did. <laughs> <laughs> But Vajay, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, we lost the director of this, um, Hugh Wilson, who died in 2018. And for, for a director, I mean, he did a lot of comedy, but never really approached the echelon of kind of his career. He had a big hit with the First Wives Club. Uh, oh, God, yeah. Which was a big hit in like 1996. Uh, he also did um, Blast from the Past, which was a Brandon Fraser movie before mm -hmm. Brandon Fraser movie disappeared. He also did Dudley Do Right as well, which was Brandon Fraser. Right. To another movie that kind of uh, vanished. Uh, the producer of this was Paul Maslansky. Now, Paul Maslansky, he had around 24 movies before Police Academy and never made a hit. Right. So all that, he'd never had a hit. He had 24 movies before Police Academy. Police Academy was the movie that went pow, bang, and switched yeah, it, it on. The story uh, behind how Police Academy came to be was on the set of the, the deeply serious astronaut movie, The Right Stuff, that was uh, made about the Mercury astronauts. They hired the police for crowd control on the movie set. right? And this police force actually sent um, some of their, what must have been their worst police cadets and he said, apparently, Paul Maslansky saw all these police cats falling off a bus and they were like, all shapes and sizes, like totally out of shape and everything. And they were like, what the hell's going on? And they proved so inept at their job that their captain was just like chewing them out fully for being so useless. You people are D squad. D for dirt bags. And it kickstart a franchise. Now, I'm trying to remember. I think it, I think it was either Paul Maslansky, or it was uh, or it was the director. One of them played the guy during the the time where High Towers trying to do his driving. Yes, is driving. He's the director. Uh, yes, Hugh Wilson. Yeah, Hugh Wilson. <laughs> and that very slow walk back with the expression on his face, I absolutely love yeah. that. Yeah, that was Hugh Wilson. That came about because the actor who was originally hired for that yeah. spot apparently got passed out drunk before they were due to start filming. And uh, Hugh Wilson was like, oh, screw it, I'll do it. Oh, yeah, but that, no, I love these movies. Um, and I think like any movie where it's got yearly entries, it does become a, like a pastiche for itself before too long. And then you do end up with stuff like um, City Under something. Siege, which was... A mission to Moscow, which was basically oh! going off the cliff. Oh, God, that one's horrible. Some people had tax to pay. That's all I can say with that movie. Oh, God, yeah. But they, like the first... I'd say like the first three or four were really, really good comedies. But I more than anything else, four. one and, and two had, had its moments. Had its moments. Um, but I honestly think most of the movies were kind of they were very similar to the stuff that you had with like with Animal House. Like you had this very, very vague framework, and then just a series of vignettes that just filled up the gaps. Yeah. With like a little bit of sliver of plot here or there to try and link it all together. But most of it, you could pull out and then put into something else easily. And it would have no real impact on the actual story. Um, but uh, but it did introduce us to some really, really talented actors. You know, yes. including, um, and including the phenomenally talented Michael Winslow. Yes, I had a run in with him at a, a Comic Con that we went to. Yes, I had, a, yes. I had a brief exchange with him because we were standing outside the um, Blue Oyster Bar set, and Michael yeah. Winslow walked out the door of it, and he said, uh, "You think it's wild here? You should go inside." Yeah, <laughs> I just said, "What makes you think I haven't been inside?" But um, yeah, in, in case you're wondering, the uh, the logo that we've got on our little on on a yes. little picture of the two of us holding hands that was from that, was... that day. That was from a picture that we took that day. The last public appearance of uh, the actress who played Hooks, she didn't seem really with it on that day. She looked like really confused and pain, and then she she passed away. I think it was only months later. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole Hooks character is great because she just decided to do that voice, and she was basically based on Michael Jackson. 
Michael yeah. Jackson. Yes, yeah. she was doing it as a Michael Jackson. She doesn't sound like that at all. She is more the don't move, dirtbag. Bill Clinton has classed this as one of his favorite movies. And I can't imagine why. Insert is it because here's of- a blowjob podium scene. <laughs> <laughs> I was there thinking it was Tackleberry playing the saxophone on the beach, but obviously, yeah. <laughs> Either way. Well, this Either is one actually... works. Someone's blowing a horn anyway. Strangely enough, this is the only R-rated police... Nothing! Movie. Nothing for blowing a horn? Oh, God. No. Get you. Sorry, I completely missed that. Yes. No, mad. Well, this is actually the only R-rated Police Academy movie, which is surprising... Because um, Police Academy 2 has quite a few risque jokes in there, mm. including blackface. Yeah, well, this one does it does have some kind of choice racial epithets in it, which, uh, which we're not going to repeat. No, there's a fantastic outtake that they left in this movie. And uh, it's this scene. <laughs> Hooks. She has how you know they're under fire and they're pinned down. She says, I bet there's a back door to this place. And she runs at the back door and bounces off it because it was locked. <laughs> Captain Harris is uh, the standout character for everybody. Uh, GW Bailey. Everyone remembers the shoe polish around the megaphone joke. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the person who probably remembers that joke more is Michael Winner because apparently that is a very real thing somebody did to him on the set of one of his movies. From what um, I've heard about Michael Winner, that doesn't surprise me. Calm down, dear. When Police Academy was released on VHS, it actually broke records. It sold 107,000 copies in one week. Wow. Really good for the 1980s. For the early 80s. Yeah. What you've got to yeah. remember is there was a window between rentals and sell-through back in the 80s. A lot of you new age kids born in the DVD era will not appreciate this additional four to six month window. Obviously you had the theatrical window, then it mm-hmm. come out rental, then you had your rental for about four to six months before it was available for you to buy. And this film was somehow always was on at Christmas. Yeah, I don't know why. It was always on fairly late. Um, then of course, as you go through the 90s and the 2000s, the time slot kept getting earlier. And earlier, yeah. and earlier, and more, and more started getting cut from it. The Crocodile Dundee syndrome, as it's known. Yeah, I think it's an all-time classic. Uh, major guilty pleasure for me. I love Police Academy. Worth seeing again because it is still hilarious in many senses. Um, so yes, uh, that was forty years ago this week. I think the second one's funnier, but then again, yeah, the second one is funnier, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, so what we got next? Okay, I'm just going to do this one as an honourable mention because I do want to move on from it. Um, But 30 years ago this week, D2 The Mighty Ducks was released, which was the sequel to The Mighty Ducks Are The Champions, or in the UK, simply known as Champions. Mm. And then D2 The Mighty Ducks, to make it even more confusing because they couldn't call it Champions 2. (laughs) So yes, there was a major confusion of it. This was Emilio Estevez's Ice Hockey Trilogy. I wasn't a fan of these movies. Sorry, Emilio. Um, I wasn't. Uh, but if, this was the time where Disney was very kind of... They put out a hell of a lot of family movies. I mean, they obviously put a hell of a lot out more now. And they're kind of bastardizing their entire 90s collection. They even did a series of The Mighty Ducks just recently on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Which yeah. has probably now been taken off and stuffed back in the vault to help probably. pad out their... their end of year tax return um but I, I wanted to bring that up that that was the movie that was released this week 30 years ago okay we have covered uh on our 50th episode we actually covered the first movie and now we're going to talk about the sequel because 20 years ago this week it was the release of scooby-doo 2 monsters unleashed zoinks is it better than the first Scooby-Doo? I don't know. I think it's just kind of around the same, really. Um, I'm honestly trying to remember if I've even seen it. It's the one with Alicia Silverstone in. Because it was everyone was like, oh, look, it's Alicia Silverstone. And it's also the one with um, Seth Green 
Um, oh, right. No, I've seen like bits. I've kind of drifted okay. in and out. Nah. Yeah. Well, this, this not only saw the return of all of the uh, Mystery Inc. gang, uh, it also saw the return of the director, uh, Roger Gosnell, who directed the first Scooby Doo. Um, which, you know, I like. It's a guilty pleasure. Unfortunately, there's dialogue from that movie that is ringing around in my head because when I was in the video store, that film was always on a loop. Uh, so all you heard was the soundtrack and all of the dialogue. I actually knew the twist of the film before I'd even seen it. Thanks! Bit of research. I, I was looking into uh, the origins of Scooby-Doo. Do you know how Scooby-Doo got his name? Was it... Um... Oh. See, all I can think of is that um, that Frank Sinatra song. Scooby-Dooby-Doo. Son, you are spot oh, was I? Oh, okay. Yes, a CBS executive, apparently. Uh, the show was, a, the Scooby-Doo show was originally going to be called Too Much. Creative geniuses. I have no idea exactly how much it was going to be. It's better but, than Velma. But we're meta now! Ugh. And a CBS executive, um, obviously listening to Sinatra's song, Strangers in the Night, and the scat lyrics of it, Scooby-Dooby-Doo, and apparently Scooby-Doo, that's how he got his name. So there's a nice bit of trivia for you. Um, this movie did underperform at the box office. It didn't equal um, the success of the first Scooby-Doo film. That kind of led to the cancellation of a planned third movie that they were intending to do. They did end up doing a third one, but it was like a straight to video. Yeah, yeah. No, the original cast. Wasn't it? It, was, no. it was basically just a uh, throw it out. And this one has the kind of controversial edge of Vilma having a boyfriend. Mm. Less, I'm, okay, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial now. Vilma cool. is the hot one. <laughs> she is. Especially she in the porn parodies you've been watching. <laughs> All Daphne has to get her by is her looks. You know Velma will appreciate you. Yeah, well, you choose Linda Cardellini, and, you know, it's... We all love Linda Cardellini. Who's your mommy? They missed a trick with this movie, though. Why didn't they call it... Get this? Scooby 2. Zoinks! Yeah. They should have called it Scooby 2. Mm. It was also the last Scooby-Doo movie uh, released theatrically. It wasn't supposed to be. Because the animated movie Scoob was supposed to be released theatrically. But then the pandemic like, happened and it just yeah. got shot onto HBO Max, whatever it was. Uh, so I think controver is a controversial uh, take here, which Bill may disagree with me on. I mean, this film being released at the beginning of spring, I don't think is a wise move. This is a movie that should have been released as a family movie for the Halloween period. It's yeah. perfectly set for it. I don't know if it was intended to, and maybe delays happened or whatever, or reshoots, I, I have no idea. But this is a perfect setup for that time of the year, you know, that you can take your families to see a, a spooky kids movie. You know, in spring, it's it's never gone, never going to resonate. You know, Matthew Lillard, pretty much has taken over the role of Shaggy in the animated series and everything now. Mm -hmm. The Hollywood power couple of Freddie Prinze Jr. and Sarah Michelle Gellar are kind of not even in Hollywood anymore, I don't believe. I think they're kind are of... Are they still married? Yes. Yes, they're very much still together. Married. Yeah. Uh, Good on you guys. But yeah, Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. Uh, it's fun. If you like the first Scooby-Doo movies, you know, and, and it's veiled sexual innuendo and cannabis jokes then uh you'll enjoy it who's your mommy for 10 years now um we've got a double bill on this one because there was two movies i was really torn because both of them were very interesting so i thought okay i'm just gonna throw them both out there um because you've probably not seen either so the first that'll movie short, though, anyway. what that'll make it short then anyway won't it probably yeah um so the first movie, 10 years ago this week, uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger vehicle Sabotage was released. What I'm going to say about this, and the reason why I flagged it up is, poor David Ayer, right? I, I feel for David Ayer because he is a fantastic director. You know, you, you look at movies like End of Watch, brilliant, Harsh Times, 
um, Street Kings. They were all great. And then he did Suicide Squad, the original one with Will Smith, Margot Robbie, which his version of it has still never been seen. And there's active campaigns to get his version of the movie the released. The David Ayer cut. Yes, the yeah. David Ayer cut. But it is not the only movie where it was hijacked from him. Sabotage is the other one. This was another movie that was heavily cut by the studio to make it more of an action movie instead of a you know an, an action thriller. They trimmed roughly around an hour out of this movie and beefed it up. The version that's released, you know, it was a box office bomb. You know, uh, Sabotage only made 2.1 million against a 35 million dollar budget. So Jesus, it was a it was a loss for a Schwarzenegger movie. It was actually the worst Schwarzenegger opening in over 30 years. Zoinks. That means collateral damage did more money than this did. Oh God, collateral damage is an absolute stinker. Sabotage is not a bad movie. It is actually a really good movie and has the potential to be an even better movie if we saw like David Ayer's original intention. He has a fantastic vision, you know, and when you see his movies, they are very kind of raw and, and gritty. And you have two Terminators in this movie. Sam Worthington is in this movie as well. Uh, well, well, he wasn't, well, I suppose he was. He was a Terminator, Terminator, Terminator but... Salvation. Come on. He is, oh, yeah. you've got to see it. Um, a bit of interest while I was doing a bit of research in this, I was like, where does the meaning behind the word sabotage come from? Do you know? I do know this. Oh, right. Okay. I do well, know. It, it. Well, that is it, unless this is a, apocryphal. But uh, my understanding of it was that when the uh, old mills during the Industrial Revolution started yep. to pick up in France, um, the French workers being the, uh, the proud protest heavy mob that they still are, thankfully, and to be perfectly honest, we could do with a little bit of that over here as well, um, got so pissed off with these new machines coming over that they would take their clogs, these wooden clogs that were known as sabots, yep. and launch them into the machinery. And so it became sabotage. Very good. Very Thank good. you very much. Sabotage is actually worth discovering if you missed it, and, and I'm guessing quite a lot of people did miss it. I want to see his version of Suicide Squad more than anything, but I also want to see a version of this movie because I did enjoy Sabotage. Um, and I think it, it it probably ranked there as a guilty pleasure for me. One of those movies that I would happily kind of have in my collection uh, just to revisit because sometimes the potential of a movie, you know, is better than the movie. Okay, so for, for the other movie that I was choosing yes. for 10 years, um, I really want to bring this up because I think it's a vastly underrated movie. Uh, 10 years ago this week, Darren Aronofsky's Noah was released. No, oh, okay. I remember there being a bit of a furore yes. surrounding this, yes. but I, uh, I've uh, not uh, actually seen it. Now, Darren Aronofsky does incredibly challenging movies, okay? Whether it's his debut was Pi, uh, he'd also done movies like The Fountain, uh, Requiem for a Dream, uh, Mother with Jennifer Lawrence uh, a number of years ago. He really gets into really challenging movies. And Noah is probably the one movie he wanted to make since he was probably a child. You know, it's a one story that he has always envisioned of making. You know, and, and this was a period when you were seeing a lot of those Bible movies. Some of them to lesser extent, you know, you had um, Gods of Egypt. <laughs> which was, uh, I, I don't even know where to start with that movie. But over you had... Uh, Just don't. Uh, Lee Scott did Just one, don't. Exodus. Yeah. You know, so the biblical epic was kind of coming back and it was kind of all spun off from the success of movies like Gladiator and Troy and, uh, and stuff like that. So it was the natural progression. The Legend of Hercules. Noah, yeah, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ, yeah. This movie is one of the only things that I can remember was banned before it was released in uh, Bahrain, Qatar, Egypt, China, the United Am Arab Emirates. They all banned it before the movie was even released, before they even saw it, right? Because it was a, a confliction of, like, beliefs. I watch this movie, I am not a religious person at all, and... and I do not follow any religious teachings or anything, but the movies are pretty well done. I'll give them that. And I, I can kind of appreciate that. With Noah... Is it, is it better than Evan Almighty? <laughs> yeah. Shit! 
Steve! The, the role of Nora is played by Russell Crowe. Obviously, who's no stranger to uh, the historical epics. You know, and it's, I, I can see when you look at the cast of this movie, why there was a lot of controversy, um, as there always is around movies with religious themes, in kind of whitewashing the characters. Mm. Right? When there is a lot of talent out there, I mean, it, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I, it, it's a hard one because I know you've got to sell a movie on a big name. Right? And around that time, yeah, it's probably going to be hard to find characters of certain ethnicities who can sell numbers for a movie that probably cost around, you know, a hundred million, and, and to make that return, and the, and the fact that Noah. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone's going to feel like, oh, I want to go and see a religious epic. It's it's kind of a biggest religious disaster movie you can get is Noah. And it's spectacular. It truly is a spectacular movie and, and very, very well done. Um, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, Russell Crowe's character, you know, suffering with survivor's guilt and stuff like that, it's, it's very well layered as a movie. Uh, and it was Aronofsky's highest grossing film to date still so this film was a huge hit despite being banned in so many territories you know it was a hit absolutely everywhere what you may be surprised to know is it's actually the biggest opening weekend ever for a russell crowe movie and when you factor in how big a hit gladiator was noah was bigger Midway through production on this movie, Hurricane Sandy hit. Imagine being on the set of Noah <laughs> when Hurricane Sandy hits. Straight away, they're there thinking, Jim Caviezel on Passion of the Christ getting yeah. hit by lightning. You know, it'd be like, oh. <laughs> God said to <laughs> Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody. Yeah. Here's a hurricane. Noah is a spectacular film and they did something really smart because when you, when you kind of see the animals in this movie that obviously get a hoarding in they're kind of old world variations on these animals so they're not exactly the animals as you know them they have these kind of difficulties and they have these fantastic rock creatures in it as well uh, and it is a spectacular epic movie that everybody should see just for the entertainment value if you can strip away all of the religious malarkey and stuff like that of it you know this is an, an absolutely epic movie that you realistically should see on a big screen definitely worth your time i guess that's all our suggestions then for this week for this week that Which, is our anniversaries there yes for well three and uh, well, there's a bunch well, of good yeah don't find them yeah uh right so that just leaves one part of the show left to go, and it's the question that you're all dying to ask. What's in the box? 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 It feels so long since we've heard that music, because it is. <laughs> I've been uh, to the States and back. Um, and I, I will say we are going to have um, a little party wood feature coming along because I did go to attend our previous guest, Frank Capello, his movie, The Womb. That Hi, he, Frank. Hi, Frank. That he had mentioned that he was working on way mm -hmm. back when, when he did an episode with us. Uh, finally had its, its premiere. Lockdown uh, movie. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so The Womb got um, its first theatrical showing again it's a spectacular movie uh we're going to do a little coverage i filmed some footage while we were out there uh we'll also show you the trailer of it and stuff like that uh so that's going to be coming up as a body wood show soon enough but for now it's time to pick two out of the box steve are you ready explain to our masses what oh, is inspired hey okay. well andy is gonna pull out the name of two count them two movies out of the box uh these are all either certified fresh on rotten tomatoes or they're certified interesting enough to warrant a look at now he's going to read out the name of one of the movies and if i have seen it 
then he just keeps on pulling names out of the box until we find one that I haven't seen, and then I go away and watch that movie before we record our next episode, and then he does it again with the second one. It's pretty straightforward and simple. We've been doing it now for over 100 episodes, and so far, none of it's gone wrong. <laughs> he says. He says. Okay. Cue the music, please. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Number one. He's getting good at that, isn't he? He is. Yeah. He yeah. hasn't changed his fucking name yet. No. Yeah. And changed the music neither. Good. Hey, the music works. Oh, okay. Oh, this might be might be right up your street, actually, for the first one. Yeah. Steve. The first choice. We're going back to, I believe, 2004. Okay, at least it's not 2007. No, it was earlier. Um, it has Al Pacino. And it is Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. Ooh, ooh, this is going to be interesting. Um, no, I haven't seen this. However, I was actually in a production of Merchants of Venice. Well, that's going to make it even more interesting. Yes. Oh, the first one out, Merchant of Venice. Yeah, it was Shylock himself, yeah. Good choice, good cast for it as well. Yeah. But, you know, Pacino doing Shakespeare, it's always worth it. He's a big fan of um, Merchant oh, yeah. of Venice as well. I know he's done it several times on, on uh, Broadway and what have you. Okay. Number two. Oh my god, I don't believe this. <laughs> Please don't tell me it's 2007. Oh, you know what? I think it actually is 2007. Oh god. Let me let me check this up. I want I want to see this one minute. Oh, please, but if this is 2007, this is going to be the gods are shining over us. Mm. Oh god, I don't when you're happy, I don't like it. <sighs> it is 2007. Oh god, I don't like it. No, I don't like this. <laughs> Do you know what the amazing thing is, though? Um, we actually know the director of this movie. Oh, okay. This is going to make it more interesting to... Yeah, because uh, I think I'm going to have to get him on for this. Okay. Because he's, he's due to come on anyway. Um, it was Frank Capello's He Was a Quiet Man. Oh, okay. No, I haven't seen it. Starring Christian Slater, William H. Macy, Alicia Cuthbert. Yeah. Uh, phenomenal movie. Um, I'm going to ask him because I know he did a director's cut of it recently. right? And I think it didn't get released, but he has a director's cut of it. So I'll ask him Ooh. if we can have the director's cut of it because that's the one he says he prefers, but yeah. it's not been released. That could be interesting. This this could You could be seeing, for the first time ever, unreleased footage from this movie. Yes. And it's it's a really fun film. I mean, Frank is, uh, I don't mind saying it and not to gush because he is a friend of mine. He is a creative genius and he is amazing at what he achieves with so little. And this, I believe, was the his kind of last film um, prior to uh, The Womb. So it's been a, a huge gap in his career since. Right. Uh, where he's been working on other stuff. But... Uh, so this was the last film before, and now we're going to also do a little feature on the womb. So this is a perfect lead. Okay. For no next pressure. One. I cannot believe that was pulled out. That is no pressure whatsoever. Incredible. No, you know, no, there won't be any pressure. There won't be any pressure. And there never is any pressure because I, I'm always honest, I'm always yeah. honest, and I say, I say it as I call it. Yeah, well, you were with Tom. Always to see it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, that's what that's what we like. We like differing opinions. You know, we do. Um, that way, you know, not all kissing people's ass. Um, you know, I, I actually enjoy the movie. I haven't seen it in a good long while, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'm looking forward to seeing the director's cut, so I'll message him, actually, just after this show. Um, so, yeah. Um, so we have a, a Pottywood show coming up after this. Um, of uh, We may even get Frank Capello on to talk about it, okay. because The Womb won the grand prize at the Golden State Film Festival that it was showing at. Uh, just two nights after its screening and well deserved as well and obviously we'll show the trailer and and we'll get frank to do a bit yes of it. congratulations frank for that one congratulations well deserved as well well yeah. very well deserved couldn't have happened to a nicer guy um 
then obviously we will have this show. Uh, we are uh, we have muted it, and we are going to do our Avengers special with Bill Daly. That's the 1998 that, version yeah. of the Avengers. No Robert Downey Jr. in this one. Just no. Sean Connery. And also the good news is our guests are starting to line back up to come back on. Uh, so we will be scheduling them in uh, soon enough. So for the meantime, where can people find us, Steve? Yes, well, just popping up on the bottom of the screen right now are all our socials. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, I refuse to call it X. Uh, we're on Reddit, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Instagram somewhere. We're on pretty much everything all of the time. And as well as all that, you can also catch us on our Patreon page, where for just the price of a cup of coffee every month you can get episodes a little bit earlier than normal and you also get them in a higher bit rate and also selected clips that you won't otherwise get a hold of anywhere else so there you go all for the price of a cup of coffee yes but it helps us to get uh even more content out to you so uh lovely to be back lovely to see you steve you're looking very dapper in your uh warner brothers shirt Ooh, turn me on though. We're not shills, honestly. We're, we're not my, shills. My, my my nipples down here. I'm I'm, I'm not bringing. There we go. But I do want to say a, a huge thank you to all the people that I did meet at Warner Brothers. Obviously, thank you, uh, Richard Mirish as well. It was great catching up. And actually, while I was out uh, in LA, it was great to catch up with a bunch of our former guests, including Ellen Dubin, making it over from Canada. She had a surprise Hi, drop in as well, and I said I'd say hello to you on the show. Uh, fantastic meeting up with you again and uh, we always look forward to having you back yes right well between now and then uh, I guess that is a goodbye from me and uh, I guess it's a goodbye from me too and uh, go enjoy some movies we'll catch you next week bye bye